How do we actually change ourselves? This question was urgent for me because I was running a studio based on wild creativity. We were building things like The Matrix and The Story of Stuff to try to get people to act on social change, and for a while it was working great. But the world of social media was changing so quickly around us, and as we reached certain successes, we would get more and more orders, more and more clients coming in asking us to do what we had done before, even though we knew that what we, did, what we had done before couldn't continue to work, and yet I had 50 people working for me who were dependent on the old patterns working. So how do we step back and take that deep breath and say, it's time to take an intelligent risk, it's time to do something different before we go over that waterfall and fail to make the kind of impact and change that we know we can and need to make? Now there's this myth of innovators that there are a certain number of people out there who simply love changing the world, who don't care what other people think about them, and who embrace risk, who eat it for breakfast. If you've ever seen that old Think Different ad from Apple, you know, here's to the crazy ones, you'll see that myth kind of in action. And I had always believed it too. So when I started feeling the anxiety of needing to change, I began to shut down. And then I stumbled upon the story of Mahatma Gandhi, who's one of those crazy ones in that ad. Now Gandhi, to me, is the ultimate risk taker. He faced down the British Empire. He used no violence in order to do it. He innovated entirely new ways of making social change in the 20th century. Surely he was someone who loved risk. Well, when I looked into his story more deeply, I found Gandhi was someone who couldn't do the simplest thing in front of a crowd as a young man. As a young lawyer, he once stood up in a court, and because he was so afraid of being laughed at on a $10 small claims case, no words would come out of his mouth. When it happened to him a second time, he had to flee India and go live in South Africa where he thought maybe his shame could be hidden. And he worked behind the scenes at a law firm where he wouldn't have to get in front of a jury ever again. And his life became smaller and smaller and smaller. What was happening to Gandhi is now well understood by psychologists. And it's encapsulated in what I call the safe thinking cycle. Whenever we try to do anything in this world, we're going to face a certain amount of threat awareness. Whether we're successful and we get uh, you know, brought onto bigger stages or we're starting to fail and things are closing in around us, we're going to sense a certain threat in the environment because the world is changing around us. How we respond to that threat in our brains is with something called cortical arousal. Cortical arousal is kind of a good thing. It gives us some cortisone and some adrenaline that gets us out of bed to do something. We evolved this type of uh, response on the African savanna 10 or 15,000 years ago or, or earlier when a lion would jump out at us and we knew we had to react and respond. We get flooded with anxiety. And what we would naturally do in that moment is find the safest solution to the problem that we faced. And that meant stereotypical thinking always follows too much cortical arousal. So Gandhi would face something that would make him afraid, and the first thing he would do would say, how, to, how do I move away from this anxiety? He'd pick a thing that he had tried and worked before, and that would just create more anxiety because his life was getting smaller and smaller. Now Gandhi said that there was a moment which he calls the most creative incident in his life. He was traveling on a train from one side of South Africa to another through the mountains. Somebody noticed this little brown man sitting in a seat that belonged to a white man. And so Gandhi was kicked off the train. He wasn't left with his bags or his coat. And he said in that moment, freezing on that platform, he realized that every time he had withdrawn from things that made him anxious, he felt more and more anxiety in his life. And he promised himself that he would now move towards anxiety. He would see anxiety as fear for fuel for creativity. And that seems to be the key for, for, for the best innovators in the world. They don't not feel the fear of innovation, but when they feel that fear, they tell themselves and their teams that this is a chance and an opportunity to make change, and that nothing we have ever done that's worthwhile has ever happened without first feeling fear. So the best leaders that I've spoken to and the best innovators tell me that they feel as much fear or perhaps more than the average person. But every time they do, they note it, and they resist that temptation to take the most obvious route forward. And they ask a series of questions of their teams, like if we're getting negative feedback, how deeply can we address this problem? Or if something's not working, what's a path we've never tried before? These simple questions and reframes can turn anxiety into something that we run away from, into something that we run towards. So I'll ask you, how do you deal with anxiety? And have you learned to move towards it? Are there ways in which you can better note your own feelings and get out of that safe thinking cycle, not by trying not to feel anxiety, but seeing it as fuel for creativity? A second misunderstanding is about expertise. So expertise in a world where things don't change very much is a huge advantage. So if you're a chess player, for instance, playing on a two-dimensional chessboard with rules that never change, 
The more expertise you gain, the more easily you'll be able to beat a beginner player or another chess master. Even. You'll see the moves possible and immediately know what to do. But if the rules change or if the rules are undefined, too much expertise can actually make you slower to react, can make you blind to what's happening around you. In fact, numerous studies have shown that when expert players face changing rules in games like this, they do worse than novices who have never played before. So what does this tell us? Well, I spoke to a researcher who looked at expertise and studied 200 experts over 20 years, asking them to make predictions about the future, about political changes, about uh, wars, about the economy. He wanted to see if these experts really were better than the average person at predicting the future. He found that these experts were not better than the average person. In fact, they were worse than dart-throwing monkeys at picking what was going to happen. Now, how could this possibly be? How can we be worse than random chance? Well, it turns out that there's nothing wrong with gaining experience and expertise, with knowing more about the world. In fact, we need to. In order to make an impact on our field or our industry, we must be passionate consumers of information and knowledge. But there's something called entrenchment that happens the minute that we attach our sense of self-worth, our egos, to our knowledge networks. The minute we believe ourselves to be an expert, the minute we believe ourselves to be better than average, we start greeting new information not as an opportunity to learn, but as threats to ourselves. Thank you.